Pandora's box is about to open wide. Welcome once again to Pandora's box, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this Monday evening. Um, we sadly report to you that um, Drew Jameson Ben Armstrong, a.k.a. <laughs> Drupid LeBear is not with us today. Oh, dear. Um, he is lost in the jungles of Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. Maybe never to be seen again. Uh, keep keep watching Pandora's Box every week to um, to find out whether Drew is or is not still alive. Keep okay. him in your hopes and prayers. Yeah, we'll keep you updated, guys. Mm-hmm. I wanted to uh, um, start off today talking about a lady called Pudgy Stockton. Her real name was Abby Stockton. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was just a super cool lady and really pioneering for her time. I think obviously a lot of people, when they think of things like weightlifting, um, people think about like you know like Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day. Obviously, good old Arnie, he's in his like, 70s now. And it's almost like a bit weird for us, I think, for people like my age and a bit older... Like, um, or even maybe like your age, just about boy, yeah. can sort of like remember um, Arnie f- from his movies up until sort of like the 2000s, mm-hmm. the late 2000s. He was still young enough that he could get in like really good shape for movies. And obviously he's known as like pretty pretty much sort of widely known as like the greatest bodybuilder of all time. The not, face of it, I feel yeah, like. Oh, say. Yeah, if not the greatest, yeah, the, definitely the face of it. And a lot of people do think he's the greatest of all time. There's a couple of other people as well. A lot of people, some people think that Lee Haney's the greatest. Some people think that uh, Ronnie Coleman's the greatest. Um, Has but, there always been like a big audience for bodybuilding, or was that almost like the peak yeah. of it, or even like the start of well, it? Well, Arnie's era is called the golden era, right? Um, so I think, and I think, but that's for several reasons. I think people think that almost like the physiques were the best then, mm-hmm. as well as like, I mean, I don't, I don't really know, like in terms of like when it was like necessarily in terms of like numbers like the most watched do you know what I mean or, or things like that um I think it seems to be pretty big nowadays yeah I think you know you get like I mean the biggest event in the UK I think it's called like is like body body power I mm. think in like Birmingham NEC every year um it's not just about bodybuilding it's also about like you know like uh weightlifting powerlifting strongman you even get like um MMA fighters going there and stuff like that mm. but it's always like sold out. I went there one year. I think I went like 2017 or something like that, and it was like packed. Cool. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like it's one of those things. Like, if you don't get your ticket like relatively quickly, like it might just sell out and you can't right, go. Right, 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 right. And it's like the NEC, the, the Birmingham NEC is like an, is a massive arena. Mm-hmm. And where it's like Midlands in the UK, you do just get people from like all around yeah, the freaking UK yeah, going no, that there. That makes sense. Um, makes sense. But yeah, I mean, it seems like a pretty popular thing nowadays. And, I, and like even, I think obviously like recreationally, like a lot of uh, like lads especially but I mean growing in popularity amongst women like like really into like working out and like bodybuilding mm-hmm. and stuff like bodybuilding more specifically because obviously you could be into working out and not be into bodybuilding that's the funny thing it's like um, do you know I mean just because you lift weights you're not necessarily into bodybuilding like I'm not yeah. I'm not like massively into bodybuilding really I like yeah, lifting yeah, weights yeah. I see it there, there's a difference do you know what I mean like, I'm not like in the gym thinking like necessarily the same way that like a bodybuilder would i like more do you know i mean i look, grew up look, looking up to guys as i said like watching wrestling more like like brock lesnar and mm-hmm. bill goldberg and just and that like, freak strength. yeah and like growing up watching like rugby players and that as well like, i wanted to like like uh i wanted to be able to like almost like the the most impressive thing was more like what i was doing rather than like how i looked yeah and almost like sense. but then like you know i guess like any physical like looks and that i guess is like a cool side effect but any anyway i digress i want to talk about this lady called abby um, Pudgy Stockton because as I said you know it, it's growing in popularity nowadays like lifting weights and like powerlifting and bodybuilding it's growing in popularity amongst young women nowadays mm-hmm. but obviously back in the in the 40s which is sort of Pudgy's era bear in mind this was like 20-30 years before Arnie was champ mm. I think Arnie first won his I think he won his first Olympia I want to say 1970 I know he's won no it might be 1969 I know he's won 70 in to- sorry, seven, 70 Olympias, imagine that. And he's won seven <laughs> Olympias in total. His last one was 1980, and that's his most controversial win. Right. Because he came out of retirement five years after he retired, and then he won, and a lot of people thought he shouldn't have won that year, whereas pretty much all of his other victories, it was like he was definitely the best that year. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, the first six he won, like, back-to-back. Um, but yeah, I think so. That was, like, in the 70s. Abby, Abby uh, Stockton, her heyday was, like, the 40s. Mm-hmm. And back in those days, it wasn't like really a thing that women did. Yeah. You've got to bear in mind, like, um, it might seem like weird for us nowadays, um, especially if you're like a younger listener, because it's really, you know, you, you'll go to the gym and there just will be girls lifting weights. 
But like, think back in the forties, that was like the Second World War. Yeah. Like back in those days, there was much more like defined roles between sort of men and women. It would have been a lot more taboo. Yeah, yeah, almost like taboo. Do you know what I mean? It was. It would have been considered like more of a thing, like a man. Yeah. Like that, men did. You know, like men, because it's like you know, I guess men had more labor intensive jobs anyway. And in those days, as I said, it was almost like you know, if you grew up as a woman, the majority of the time you would have probably been more steered in the direction of like domestic duties. Mm-hmm. You know, raising children. You got to bear in mind that in the forties. There wasn't even any such thing as contraception yet. Mm. So it was almost like it would have been the role of like, uh, say, like a woman's mother and grandmother to make sure that they could like know how to handle a household yeah, and look after yeah. a household and, and to like take care of domestic duties and know how to be a mum, etc. Because let's face it, when teenagers get to a certain age, they will start bumping uglies. Mm-hmm. And if you're, there, if you're in an age where they're literally like contraception wasn't invented until the early 60s. It's Which just inevitable, think, isn't it? I think it's a bit weird to think that nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. It's weird to think that there was like, it was like, that's it like, like, wasn't a thing. Like when, <laughs> when my dad was born, there was like no contraception. That is mental. That is crazy, that is isn't crazy. it? That is crazy. But um, yeah, so as I said, back in those days, you know, people bump uglies. Mm. It's just a matter of time until you're going to get pregnant. So I think that's one of the main reasons why there was more of like an emphasis on different sort of like male and female roles now. Whereas obviously nowadays, because of contraception, if a woman decides to go on the pill or whatever, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, there's different things you can do. You can get like little chip implants, can't yeah, you? And injections, yeah, yeah. all sorts of different stuff. To be honest, a lot of them, if not all of them, are probably not great for you. But at the end of the mm. day, that's, that's by the by. You know what I mean? A woman can decide to become a career woman mm. and not ever have kids. Yeah. Yeah. And that's cool. But yeah, back in these days, as I said, like the reason I want to talk about Abby Stockton was because I said she is a pioneer of like mm-hmm. women's weightlifting and, and women's bodybuilding and stuff. And I think for any women that might be listening, Let's face it, I think it's pretty much mostly blokes that listen to our show. <laughs> Probably. But um, for, any, for any women out there that, that do listen, um, you know, and maybe you do lift weights, if you don't know about Abby Pudgy Stockton, it'd be good to look into it because, you know, the lifestyle, you know, the life of, of this woman might might inspire you and stuff like that. And I think, mm. you know, to be honest, it inspires me. I mean, at the end of the day, I think, you know, um, none of us would be here without women. You know, let's, uh, mm-hmm. and it sounds like a funny thing to say in a way because it's so obvious. But you know, it's like we've we've all obviously came from women. We've, we've all got mothers and and grandmothers before that that sort of like paved the way for us and help us be the people we are today and looked after us when we were young, so that you can grow up to be whoever you want to be. And I look at an, a lady like Abby Stockton and think, you know, it must have been really she must have stuck out almost like a sore thumb in her yeah. day. You know, um, lifting weights like she she did and stuff. But yeah, she says, um, Abby Pudgy Stockton was a professional strong woman and forerunner of the present day female bodybuilders who became famous through her involvement with Muscle Beach in the 1940s. Mm. Abby Avil was born on August the 11th, 1917 and moved to Santa, Mon- Santa Monica, California in 1924. Um, and yeah, it said she was born in 1917. So freaking a long time ago, man. And mm-hmm. she died in 2006. So she had a good life. Rest in peace. It's quite funny as well. Yeah, yeah rest in peace. She was like super tiny. She was only 1.57 meters tall. So in, I mean, that's basically, I think she's like five foot two or something like that. Right, right. She was literally like five. Five foot two on the left there. <laughs> I was like, yeah, like five foot two. Do you know what I mean? Like super small mm-hmm. and only 52 kilos. Mm-hmm. So like tiny, but apparently she was like super strong. For anybody that's watching on Spotify or YouTube, I'll get some pictures up of Abby. But I mean, bear in mind as well, this was this was like um, an era before like steroids. Yeah. Like steroids weren't really developed. Like the Nazis de- started developing steroids during the Second World War to try and create like super soldiers. Mm-hmm. And then after the war finished, um, like the Soviet Union and Americans started playing around with steroids right. and stuff. And I think it was a lot of it was like leftovers of like what they found mm-hmm. in like conquered Germany. Um, in like in like German like Nazi laboratories and that. But so bear in mind, Abby Stockton... For anybody that's looking at these pictures, and if you are listening on the radio, just go on Google and Google um, Pudgy Stockton. I think this woman had no no hormones or anything, mm-hmm. like uh, unknown hormones, but look how jacked she is. Yeah. This woman was an absolute legend. Just this little pocket rocket, five foot two, mm-hmm. barely like 52 kilos or whatever, but just... The first lady of iron. That's a cool name. Yeah, man. Yeah. And it's like, uh, obviously, because I, I think it's really worth bringing her to sort of trying to bring her to the forefront um, of, I guess, just sort of like weightlifting history because everybody does know about people like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think sure. most people have heard of people like Ronnie Coleman as well. He's almost like a meme legend, Ronnie Coleman. Everyone thinks of like his sayings like, ain't nothing but a peanut and lightweight. Right, right, right. Light you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> just like this like real funny, cool, massive dude. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think, you know, people like Abby Stockton deserve to be in that limelight as well. Like just the physical development on her. 
And as I said, yet again, back in those, so the guy she's with there is, um, his name's Steve Reeves. He was very famous for like in the old black and white movies and stuff. He played uh, Hercules. Oh, cool. A lot. And he was like one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's um, sort of like role models. Cool. As well, growing up. And along with this guy called Reg Park. Reg Park was, um, I'm actually a really big fan of Reg Park and I consider Reg Park a bit of an idol of mine. Because you've got to bear in mind, back in those days as well, you know what I was saying a bit earlier on, how there's like, the lines are very like distinct nowadays between like bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman. Yeah, Back in sure. those days, the lines were very blurred. Mm -hmm. It was almost like if you lift weights, you would just sort of do everything. Yeah, yeah, Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So you would do like strength displays. You would do almost like, you know, you'd be, you'd, people would ask you to go into like theatres. Yeah. Like the Royal Albert Hall, which is like funny because it's like things like that don't really happen nowadays. In fact, actually saying that, I think the last, last year, they did have a strongman event in the Royal Albert Hall for the first time in like a hundred years. Cool. Or something like that. Because that is almost <laughs> a growing genre as well, isn't it? Like strongman competitions, oh, yeah. like... So many people go and watch like the world's strongest oh, man mate, every single it. year. It's I such it. like it's it's so entertaining to watch as well. Oh yeah, I went to watch Europe's strongest man in Leeds. It's held in Leeds every year, like a couple of years ago. I think it was like 2018. Mm -hmm. Um or maybe in 2019. But yeah, man, I I, I freaking loved it. Yeah. I would have been again since if it wasn't for the fact that obviously like since then I've had a kid and obviously the whole coronavirus pandemic mm -hmm. happened so for it, it was like two years it was cancelled, you know, kids, blah 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 blah. But I'll yeah. definitely go again and I would have I would have gone more times if it wasn't for all those 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 hurdles, those obstacles. But yeah, back in the day, because strength was one of those things it was like strength and like big physiques, because it was so much rarer, because as I said, people weren't there wasn't such a thing as steroids to take. Yeah. So people that were like genuinely like really big and strong would have been much rarer. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, any any freaking bricklayer in your local town can get into weights, meet some dodgy bloke down the gym, yeah, start yeah. taking steroids. And as long as you're making sure you're like getting in enough calories. So I know like a lot of guys and that, do you know what I mean? They don't, they're not focused on the diet at all. They mm. literally were just like living off like kebabs and- Just cheating. And like <laughs> and McDonald's and stuff. But because you've got that amount of like testosterone and stuff in your body, um, and you know, if, because they're like lifting weights, they are just going to get jacked. But in those mm -hmm. days, it was like super rare because you have to have a good genetics for lifting, and then you have to be willing to put in the work. And it was at, less of a culture around it back then as well, I mm -hmm. imagine too. But it, but it was more of a spectacle, I think, in terms of because there was such a distinct difference between, say, like the average person in the population mm -hmm. and somebody that would have looked like Abby Stockton or Steve Reeves or Reg Park. Mm -hmm. um, it was more of like a it was more of like a spectacle in terms of like you know people would pay to go to the theater and just watch somebody on stage yeah um and it's almost like you know that it's almost like considered like almost like a comic-y, like jokey thing nowadays but you know almost like, like that funny image everyone has of like a strong man in a circus with like the uh -huh. leopard skin loincloth it the was leotard. like that <laughs> it was like yeah yeah like a yeah and like a leotard it was sort of like that people would pay to go and watch and then you know they would do like lift like massive barbells like massive concrete slabs on the end mm -hmm. over their heads and you know, lifting other people over their heads and stuff like that. And then sort of like showing off their muscles at the same time. Mm. And that was sort of like the era. And the era. But people um, like Abby Stockton, that's sort of like what she did in her era. She used to work out pretty much all day. Uh -huh. And people would just go to California, watch her work out. And then she would get paid also to do like sort of exhibitions. And, you know, you see her here like lifting this massive dumbbell over her head. Mm -hmm. I said, yet yeah, again, for people that listen on the radio, if you... um. Listen, you know, go check us out on YouTube or Spotify. You can look at, we're bringing up all these pictures as I'm talking, but just all these different cool pictures of Abby Stockton, you know, like back in the day. I find it super Ripped. impressive, man. Yeah, I find 100%, it super man. impressive. And yet again, you know, what a pioneer of a woman because uh, she was like the only woman doing this stuff back in those days. So mm -hmm. that, that, that doesn't just, so the physicality doesn't just impress me. It was actually quite brave of her. Yeah, definitely. You know, because I'm, I'm sure like a lot of like very old fashioned and, weird like sort of minded people might have like frowned upon it mm. you know but she obviously just didn't care and i think that's i think that's really cool yeah definitely some of these 100%. black and white some of these black and white pictures are, are awesome like looking at them i mm -hmm. think so cool <laughs> but yeah they used to do like crazy sort of like feats of strength i'm pretty sure i've seen one like a picture of her and she's like there's like all these uh like strong men sort of lifting several other strong men over their head and then she's like on top lifting lifting a bloke over their that's head. Does that it. sort of make sense? Almost like gymnastics yeah, yeah, or like yeah, yeah. or like cheerleading, I guess. I imagine you know? for the audience, like for the people that would have been going to the theatre to go watch this, it must have almost been like they they can't even comprehend how someone would be that strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think, you know, nowadays, if you want to get into weightlifting, you can go on Google or YouTube and you can find out. Do you know what I mean? And you can... Yeah. 
you can download apps even. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I know there's a there's a really, really smart strength and conditioning sort of coach and a great strong man, great power lifter called Chad Wesley Smith. And he's got like a great app out called like um, Juggernaut AI. Right. And it's basically, it's like this really smartly made AI app mm. um, that it's basically, it's like you've got like, it's been programmed with like all of his knowledge and all of his fellow coaches' knowledge. So it's like you basically have like a world-class coach so that's on an app. And all you need to do is put in like your age, your mm-hmm. goals, your weight, blah, and and then the AI will perfectly tailor, like as well as Chad, Lee, uh, Chad Wesley Smith would, mm. it will tailor your training like perfectly. Man, that's so cool. Like I, yeah. lo- I love AI. Yeah, I yeah. know we were going to get into it like a couple of weeks back, but yeah. the advancement in AI as of recent, I feel like even just from the beginning of this year, yeah, I've seen so much more stuff that every every single time I see it, it just blows my mind. It is crazy. I'm man. trying to incorporate it more into like my daily life as well. Like I use ChatGPT quite a lot to like just help with stuff and uh, it helps you get work done and stuff. 100%. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, I think most businesses are waking up to how AI can help just basically um, maximize their time mm. and stuff like that because why would you spend hours typing something out if you can put in you know you, you what you need to know you is you just go write me this you need to know yeah. it. <laughs> and it's like and it's not like you're even cheating really because what you're doing is like you you need to put in the key information which yeah. is basically what separates you from somebody that's not an expert in your field mm-hmm. but then you can type it into the ai and the ai is just going to fill in the blanks which is basically all the just the tedious words you know like it's mm-hmm. almost like you know when you like do a writing essay and you have to do like a 4000 word essay yeah, or exactly. it's like ah oh. You like, can let's just write it in like a thousand words and be like, boost this to four yeah. thousand. Ninety five percent of what you're writing isn't actually like content, the, the good really. content, which is going to get you a high grade. Mm-hmm. It's just filler, mm-hmm. isn't it? It's just the and then uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I do feel like it, it. There's so much to learn from AI at the moment that could make everyone's daily life just a lot easier. But sort of go back to what I was saying. This is what makes like these people so much more impressive because mm. they didn't have any of that. Yeah, and 100%. there weren't, and there were some like very rudimentary magazines and stuff like that, but with like some sort of like you know brief and very vague descriptions on how to do certain exercises. Mm. But this was all hard work and trial and error. Mm. Like, look at this, look at this uh, picture here. Um, that for is anyone, crazy. This is uh, Abby Stockton lifting a full grown man over her head, like military pressing him. Like even if say that guy's quite a light guy, like let's let's say he's like I don't know seventy kg, I don't mm-hmm. know, you know like a hundred and I don't know seventy pounds, something yeah. like that. Like that's still insanely impressive. She I was, couldn't do that. She was five <laughs> foot two. Yeah, and she was natural. Yeah, that's, that's just that's just diet and training all the time. Like that is nuts. Look at this. Like this, what like a quite a big looking barbell, just one arm overhead. Like what a woman. Mm-hmm. Like do you know what I mean? She's got like crazy genetics. Like crazy genetics. I'm just like madly, madly impressed. So what a legend, Abby Stockton. Shout out to Abby Stockton. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like a a strength pioneer that should be more well known in my opinion. Um, So yeah, just wanted to bring her to to the forefront, bring her to the masses. I think anybody that sort of like spreads the word of someone like, you know, does almost like justice to a woman like Abby Stockton. As I said, it was a massive pioneer. Yeah, I said the amount of women out, out there nowadays that like weightlift and bodybuild and even some women to this day still say that they feel like a little bit intimidated sometimes going into like the weight area of some mm-hmm. gyms especially if it's more of like a masculine gym and there's like loads of big jack bold dudes like grunting and throwing weights yeah, around there's like freaking Goldberg chalk everywhere and stuff around. yeah yeah and there's just like <laughs> chalk everywhere and sweat and there's like three just big jack dudes in the corner just grunting and snarling like looking at you mm-hmm. like you're a piece of freaking meat do you know what I mean and you're just there trying to like lift some weights or something yeah, you feel like yeah. a good looking young woman or something you know what I mean it's like you know this. You know to, to think this woman was doing it back in these days. And but one thing I think is really nice as well is, you know, even though it was a different era and it was the forties and it was you might you know very old fashioned women didn't do it back then. She was like celebrated even in her time. Yeah, that which is, is good. really nice. Like you know, I think a lot of people might think like, oh, you know, was she not like scrutinized? And I'm sure there probably was a small like section of the population that might have scrutinized her, but. Um, the only things I've ever heard of her were like was that she was super celebrated and that people were just were just sort of like in awe of her. That's so cool. So what a legend, Abby Stockton. Said if you don't if you've never heard about her before, um, and you, you're interested in what we're saying, yet yeah, Google and YouTube, Abby Stockton. There's loads of cool mm-hmm. pictures and stories about her out there. What a legend, Pudgy Stockton a is. Friend of the past. Yeah, and it's weird because I don't even like really sort of like in, intend for this to be the case, but this is almost like a. This is this is a bit of like a feminist um, 
episode, mm. which is cool. I said show and respect to the ladies. Female talk, power. I'm going to talk about another lady now called um, Catherine Switzer. Mm-hmm. Um, just sort of like leads into it quite nicely. But um, she's another revolutionary woman. Did you know that women weren't allowed, didn't used to be allowed to run marathons? No, but... Yeah, so up, up until the, I don't know if it was up until the late 60s or the early 70s, women literally weren't allowed to enter marathons. Um, I don't really know why. I don't really know what the the thought process was behind yeah. that. But literally, yeah, women w- like f- could not enter a marathon. That is crazy. And crazy. then and then once in um, 1967, um, a lady called Catherine Virginia Switzer decided that she was going to enter the Boston Marathon. Mm-hmm. And um, it apparently it sort of worked to her favour because it was like a really cold and rainy day. Right. So she had like tracksuit bottoms on, like a, and like a hoodie on with the hood up. Right. And obviously, like it was like quite a dull rainy day. Like Boston weather is like quite similar to like uh, yeah. like English weather. Yeah, um, for sure. That's one of the reasons why I know it's not, you know, like near Boston, you've got like New England and stuff. It's like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's, it's very similar on the on certain areas of the East Coast are quite similar to Britain. So it's that sort of like, you know, rainy, it's dark. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so people just didn't notice. And I think what she did is when she signed up, because you have to obviously put your name on like the clipboard or whatever, she just put her initials. She just put like, nice. she just put like nice. K, K Spitzer. And just nobody really questioned it. I think mm-hmm. there was like hundreds of people in the marathon. So it's like, you know, no one's going to like, I guess, scrutinize it too much. But yeah, she got about halfway through the marathon and um, it just so happened, I think, that like uh, the guy that literally was like running the event was going past in like a press car. Right. And he noticed that a woman was doing it. And he, he this is, what's, it's real funny in a way because it just goes to show it's like super douchey. Like he's, I think like if it was me, even if it was like the rule at the time mm-hmm. that like women weren't allowed to enter, I'd just be like, oh, it was a woman. Oh, right. Uh, okay. Well, a bit, <laughs> yeah. bit like at the time, like I would probably think, yeah, it might be a bit weird because I guess if it was the first woman you've ever seen running a marathon, you would think it was weird. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, but you'd just be like, okay, cool, whatever. Yeah. Like, I, would, like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I just wouldn't care. But the guy um, f- like flew into almost like a rage, jumped off the press car and started like running towards the woman and was started, like trying to like grab her. Um, and apparently like shouted at her and he was like trying to like pull her, her number. You know, you get given like a number yeah. when you run a marathon. He tried to pull it off her. Right. Um, and was trying to like stop her from doing it. Um, and there's pictures, yeah, again, people that watch it on Spotify and YouTube, I've got up some pictures. Um, so you can see just about in the background behind her, there's a guy in a suit. That's the guy that was running the event and he was right. trying to, he was trying to stop her. Um, but her husband was, ma- was running the marathon with her and this is this guy there. Nice. And um, because obviously, like like you would if you saw your missus getting harassed, he just freaking just like bolded them out of the way, just like ta- uh-huh. essentially tackled him out of the way. And it's quite like a famous um, picture nowadays. Like you can see some bits of it. Like I'll, I'll try and find some more where he like, but That's he, a very but cool he photo. full on like pushed the guy over, man. He like, and it's quite good because you you can see video footage of it. It was filmed, uh-huh. so you can see just like this footage of him just like getting. <laughs> absolutely obliterated <laughs> and it's really funny but look at this funny little guy like just <laughs> but yeah so her husband like full on tanked him over and then they were like really worried obviously that then I don't know like police or, or like event security or something want to come after him uh-huh. so they, they were with another guy as well who was like their running coach right. and apparently the running coach was just like right just sprint as fast as you can and they were already tired because they were like halfway through the marathon but apparently the three of them like tanked it off nice um, getting that extra bit of adrenaline yeah and, they, and like people didn't like catch up to them or try and stop them or anything and they they all completed the marathon and she's the first ever woman to run a marathon nice and said so yet, yet again a bit of almost like a suffragette movement sort of yeah, thing yeah 100% like obviously did it when she wasn't even supposed to be doing it like she wasn't mm. even really allowed to do it she just decided she was going to do it um, there was only one silly sod that sort of had a problem with it, and it was the event organizer. Um, but her husband sort of took care of him. And um, <laughs> what a way of sending the message as well. I love how that's almost worked out in their favor in the end. Yeah, because yeah. you see that photo of the guy just tackling the the guy that's trying to pull her off. Yeah, and it's just like that. I, that makes you almost like so much more like, oh, fair shout, you know? Yeah, man. 100%. You actually managed to complete the entire thing. Actually, you know, the first person ever. That's so cool. So yeah, man. Cool. And then I think you know I don't I'm, I'm I don't think it was like literally the year after, but within a couple of years because of what had happened. And I think partly people didn't think that women were physically capable of of completing a marathon, right? Which is quite funny, really. And um, you know, I mean, I know um, as somebody that's like literally a, a qualified PT and 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 has trained a lot of people, 
Like, I'll be the first to say, and like straight up, this is just like facts, like this is straight up biology. Like, yeah, there are big physical differences between uh, men and women. And men, like 90% of the time, will be stronger than women, um, will be more explosive, things like that. Um, usually tend to have quicker reflexes. That's why like men's, you know, see like something like a sport like football, which obviously you're mm. a big and super winkle. Even though it's not like a strength contest, the reason why it wouldn't be fair for the women to go against the guys is not only can the guys sprint way faster, which is like mm. basically power, it's fast twitch muscle fibers, but guys like physical coordination and reflexes tend to be more honed. Yeah. Um, but the reason why it's funny with, um, say, like marathon running is actually long distance running is one of the sports that women are actually naturally better at than mm. men. And the reason why is, is because the same way that men are naturally stronger than women, women actually have better cardio than men. Right. That's just across the board. Pretty yeah. Much. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's, it's not, it's not just, um, it's a common trait in mammals in general, but mm. yeah, in, in humankind, men tend to be stronger. As I say, tend to be, you know, 90% of the time, obviously mm -hmm. you're always going to get like, you know, you're going to get, always get some little kind of skinny guys sometimes and you're going to get some really big, broad, strong yeah, women yeah, who yeah. had like giants parents or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is a generalization, but generalizations are just that they're, ge they're a general rule. Mm. Um, so men are in, t in general are stronger, but women do tend to have better cardio. And I, and I said, I, that's it. I mean, I know that from, from reading scientific literature, but I also have seen that anecdotally from, my own experience. training experience. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, my, my missus say me and she was like a, she hasn't trained sort of like seriously in, a, in like a few years, but I mean, she was like my number one training partner for about like three or four years, like pretty much nonstop. Mm -hmm. So like multiple sessions a week. And one thing that was always like really impressive and like almost like shockingly impressive to me was um, how quickly she would recover in between sets. Right. So obviously when you do like weightlifting, you will do like sets. So you've got like your certain amount of sets that you're going to be doing that day as part of your workout. And, you know, and then you've got, yeah. So whatever. So say you're doing, I don't know, five sets of deadlifts. Mm -hmm. Like it would take me about, if I'm doing like heavy deadlifts, I'd want about between two and a half to three minutes in between sets to recover. Whereas like 60 seconds and she'd be ready. Yeah. Just like, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. 60 seconds and she is, she's, she's ready to go. And I'd almost be a bit like, Oh man, I'll be honest, I'm still out. pretty tired, but like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to freaking try and do it anyway yeah. because, you know, I don't want to, you know, out of like a pride sort of thing, but like, yeah, super impressive. And I see it with them, um, you know, and it's not just with my missus, pretty much any, any woman I work out with, it always impresses me how quickly they can recover their mm -hmm. ability to recover from intense exercise, where you see with guys, it will take a little bit longer. Yeah, and there's lots sure. of different physiological reasons why that is. Partly it is just like a size thing. Um, if you are really big. Um, it's a bit like almost like think about it like like um like vehicles. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. um like if you've got like a mass think about one of those massive American trucks, mm -hmm. right? Like massive American like eighteen wheeler or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, it's gonna be able to like let's face it. If it went into a house, the whole house would come smashing down. Yeah. But it's going to take a little bit f longer for it to get up to running speed. Yeah. Um, and it's not going to be as like sort of like nimble. It's and a lot more energy and it's gonna, to get to and, that point. And think well. about how much fuel it's going to burn. Uh huh. Whereas like if you think about a woman as almost like a Golf GTI, like a nice nippy little, it's mm -hmm. very fuel, you know what I mean? Like a full tank is going to go take it quite a long way and it's really freaking like nifty and everything like that. Yeah. But... Uh, if it if it crashed into a house, you probably do more damage probably to the bounce car. Off, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah do you know what I mean, so it's a bit like that, really. But yeah, yeah. I just want to do another shout out to um, yeah another pioneer in the female sort of like athletics world, mm -hmm. Catherine Switzer. So two absolute legends of um, yeah women's athletics. One in sort of the running world in the the long distance running world, and the other in the weightlifting world. So um, Catherine Switzer and uh, Pudgy Stockton, you both are. Friends of the pod. Friend of the pod. I know that Pudgy Stockton um, sadly passed away not that long ago, actually. I think, what did I say? Like 2006. 2016 or something like that. Oh, 2006, was 2006, it? 2006, I believe. Yeah, so she's uh, passed away, unfortunately. It looks like um, Catherine Switzer is still alive. Nice. So still going strong. She was born 1947, so she's 76. All that running obviously did her good. Mm hmm So, yes, yeah, still alive. Nice. What a woman. What a woman. I always like think I'm like impressed by stuff like that. Like I've always been impressed by like power. Do you know what I mean? And I don't mean like power like a CEO mm. or anything like that. Like you know what I mean? Like a business owner or something. I'm talking about like 
anybody that like impresses me. Like it could just be like I meet someone and I can tell they're really smart. Right. And if I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, this person's smarter than me. And it almost like, almost like excites me, man. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, this is freaking cool. And I'm like, this, and it's this instant like respect thing. And I think I want to be around this. Mm-hmm. I want to be around this person. Or it could be, yeah, it could be like, I meet someone, you know, like, and they're just a freaking amazing at weightlifting or they're amazing at running or they're amazing at an instrument or they're amazing at art or something. Like, it doesn't really matter what it is, but if it's like to such a level that I sort of, I'm naturally like, whoa. Yeah. Or or it could even be like, um, you know, like, uh, I think there's something really admirable about people that can like, um, almost like handle adversity and like, and like, um, and thrive through adver- adversity. Right, yeah, you know yeah, when you yeah, hear yeah. about people 100%. that are sort of like, like I know a couple of women that are like it now. I think naturally because of my age, I know a lot of people sort of like from from my school and stuff that nowadays have kids, mm. um, but they also have jobs and then they also go to the gym and stuff. And it's like, um, like you say, the the right word for it is just admirable. Yeah, I mean, like, I, that's something you look at and you just go, fair play. There, there was a there was a girl that um, was in mine and Josh's um, Bullwinkle's older brother Josh who mm-hmm. swore the gold who's done some dark deals and is one of my oldest mates um, uh, there was a girl that was in mine and Josh's primary school and secondary school called um, Jessica Hillier her name's Jess Jacobson now and uh, like, I sort of like admire her, her in a way like she, you know she's got like um, you know she works all the time she's got a kid um, but she's working out all the time the other day I saw that like just a couple of days ago she did like a half marathon right um, but you know she like weight lifts as well and stuff and she's one of those people as well that just seems very positive yeah so like your mum would definitely remember Jess, right? Like if, right, if, yeah, right. I mean, you might even I don't know, but um, yeah. I mean, her her birthday was I think her birthday is like March 9th or something. So when when we were really young, mm. Jess and Josh used to often have joint birthday parties. Yeah, I've definitely heard about. You probably before. might have seen like old pitch photographs of like probably. Josh's birthdays and like Josh's like I think like there is like Superman and Jess is there or something. Like. Yeah, yeah, no, that rings a bell. Yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like even just like people like that. Do you know what I mean? And and my missus as well. I you know I I, I admire her as well. You know, she's she's always like working. Do you know what I mean? She's got like sort of like three part-time jobs. Mm-hmm. And obviously I see, you know, how much, um, you know, effort she puts into being a mum as well. Um, you know, always doing stuff. You know, she was like baked like a massive wedding cake for this wedding we went to the other day, like last week, sort of like in the evenings. That so was like her only sort of free time to like, like you know, squeeze it in. Mm-hmm. So like that. And I just think, you know, it's just admirable, isn't it? I think fair shout. And it's, it, it is almost like an attractive quality. So, I mean, mm. I don't mean like attractive in like a in like an, a sexual sense. It's just as like a hu- one human being to another. Yeah, you just think fair shout. You're just drawn to that yeah. person. You just think like fair, fair shout. You know, <laughs> like that's just that's just awesome. Hundred percent. I love that these people have like left a full on legacy as well mm. of of being these people that you know striving women to get into these new places mm. in the world. Like like we were saying with Pudgy Stockton, like the amount of people that would have been doing weightlifting or bodybuilding before her probably yeah. was less. Than after her, I imagine oh. she would have had quite an quite an inspiration to a lot of other women to oh. do the same thing. Definitely around the time because she was like, especially in like California. Obviously, the world was a lot of a a lot of a bigger place back then, so the like yeah, word yeah. wouldn't have spread as much. If she was alive, if she was alive today, I'm sure she would be like world famous. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, you know, even like back in those days, she was like a celebrity, mm-hmm. and I'm sure there are lots of women that would have picked up weights. You know, picked up weights because of. Because of uh, Abby, yeah, for I'm sure. just trying to find any like see if there's a uh, any like actual footage of of um you know that promoter guy I was talking about uh-huh. with like, the the marathon getting shoved. Yeah, because I could have sworn <laughs> I've seen I could have sworn I've seen like a, a like, actual footage of him being tanked over, and I thought it was like quite funny at the time I'm not gonna, <laughs> because the guy did like her husband like full on went for it. Right, right, right. Full on went for it. It was you like flying. I was gonna say it was like a rugby tackle, but it was more of like an American football because he's like you know he didn't. In rugby, they more like tackle them to the ground. Where yeah. it, was more, it was more of just like a massive boom, just a barge. Like, That's yeah, cool. like a barge, and the guy just went flying. I've got to try and find it. I've got to try and find it. Sorry, folks, just give me two <laughs> seconds while I'm trying to find it because it'll be worth it if you're watching on Spotify or or YouTube. It'll be worth it seeing this guy getting tanked over. I really want to see it. Oh, there, there it is! What? Well, so look, so look. <laughs> Oh yeah! <laughs> so yeah, her husband just like barged him fully out the way. I love how that was just that. Then the guy just gave, gave up. He yeah, was, it was like, just oh, like fair absolutely. play. <laughs> it probably like shocked him a little bit. He probably, he probably. I reckon. I mean, I don't know if he even thought about it in this much depth, but he, I reckon he probably thought that like the other male competitors would probably have his back. Yeah. But then for I sure. think when he saw that actually, like you know, if he was going to get like a sen- um, uh, 
like potentially like physically hurt because mm-hmm. you can see the guy's not very fit or anything. He looks like yeah, he's getting on yeah. an age a bit. You probably thought, actually, I don't want like this like young super marathon runner to like yeah. freaking kill me. You know? Not worth it. <laughs> yeah, I want to watch it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> bit earlier. Was it a bit earlier? I think. There we go. Let's try. Okay. I think it's about now. Do you reckon? I reckon it's before that. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon it's like right at the start of the Oh, video. no, you're right. Yeah, you maybe. are right. Boom. <laughs> Good night, Irene. <laughs> Keep on running. Yeah, I think like with this week's um, pod, I thought it'd be like a good uh, uh, opportunity to just sort of like catch up on a lot of like stuff that I've like saved yeah. over the last sort of month or two. Because as we sort of say every week, we never talk about what we uh, end up like planning to talk about. We uh-huh. always end up just sparring off. And that's really, really cool. But also, there is some stuff that's really noteworthy. That Obviously, I save it for a reason. I mm. save it because I think it's stuff that's going to make, regardless of who you are, you're going to go, huh, that's cool. cool. <laughs> you know I mean? Which is like, obviously, sort of one of the whole things that we wanted to do with the pod, with yeah. Pandora's box, was to do that. Like, regardless of who you are, do you know what I mean? We, we talk about a, a wide variety of subjects, and it's almost like, regardless of what you're into personally, it's all stuff that I think, as a human being, you can just go, huh. That's well cool. Cool. <laughs> One of the other things I want to talk about was um, the Java Man. This is cool. So this was um, so the first upright uh, hominid was mm-hmm. called uh, Homo erectus, and obviously it's called Homo erectus. Funny name goes. Am I right? <laughs> but um, yeah, obviously it's called Homo erectus because it was the first ape that stood up on two feet. So for whatever reason, there's varying theories. But for whatever reason, it came down out of the trees in Africa and it stood up on two feet. And we mm-hmm. think there's there's several reasons that sort of like make sense why it did. If it was coming down onto the ground, started doing it like regularly. So you can imagine why, let's say, you know, there's an ape in a tree. It, maybe there was not actually that much food for whatever reason in the trees. Mm. They start noticing there's actually quite a lot of food on the ground. But that's where all the lions are. That's where all the hyenas are, mm-hmm. etc. And even the things that aren't going to try and eat you, but you know mega testosterone fuel big herbivores like rhinos and elephants that and hippos that will sort of kill you just because you're sort of in the way yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so you know it's dangerous to be down there but if they're noticing that there's more food down there they're going to start going down getting stuff going back to the trees well after a while it becomes less frequent that they're going back to the trees mm-hmm. now what do you, like one of the things that's like really beneficial obviously of standing on two feet rather than being on all fours is because you can see further oh I, I thought you were going to say because you got hands well, that is hands an, available. That that is another. That is none of the, none of the other main ones. But we think mm. what happened first would have been like think about it. If you're like looking around for predators, yeah, of course. If your head, if your head is say like three feet of height, mm-hmm. you're not going to be see as far as if your head is five and a half to six feet of height. Yeah, no, that makes so, sense. So you're probably a bit like bears, a bit like modern bears or like modern apes. Mm. Um, you know, other than Homo sapiens, they would have probably like sporadically gone on on two legs to almost like scan the horizon, see what's about, check that there's no lions creeping up on them or anything like that, and also to see mm-hmm. if there's any prey available um, for themselves, like whatever it may be, whether it be vegetation or or um, or, or um, animal product. And then they would have gone back on all fours, chilled for a little bit. Well, a- after a while, another thing what Bullwinkle was saying, having obviously your hands free, it opens you up to holding weapons. Yep. So what it probably would have been at first um, is, you know, if an animal comes near, they might have picked up like a, a, a big rock and like chucked it at the mm-hmm. lion's face or something. Anything to try and deter the lion. After, you know, and then it might have been a massive branch. Yeah. I'm going to smack this hyena around the chops of a branch because mm-hmm. I really don't want it to try and eat me. Do you know what I mean? And then like, you put the stick and the rock together and you make a yeah. spear. Yeah, you probably, <laughs> like, you know, at first sharpen the, the branch mm-hmm. doing that. And then after a while you realise, oh, actually... It'd be pretty cool if we tried to sharpen like a bit of stone. Like, is that possible? Mm-hmm. Start smacking some rocks together, breaking them off into some little sort of like shards almost. Oh, this is possible. Mm-hmm. I can just get like some whatever, like some some vine, some like extra tough vine off this tree and I'll wrap it around that. And then you've got some rudimentary Stone Age spear. You know, you can so, you can so see how um, these things would have happened. I love how that part of evolution works. Oh, I like the idea of, a, of like an olden Homo erectus, like, setting up a stick and mm. going, oh, I've done it now. This is this mm. is as good as it gets. And then in a couple of years, you're like, you've got a rock on a stick. And, and, then, and then just thinking every every step in yeah. the world would have been a, a huge like oh, yeah. difference to what they had before. And it's funny because in some ways, it's no different than today. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like regardless definitely. of what, whatever's like invented that year, because let's face it, every year there's little inventions, right? Mm. 
think about the crazy inventions that have happened in your lifetime. Like whoever's listening, regardless of what age you are, I guarantee you within your lifetime that there have been insane advancements. Uh -huh. You see it almost every year. So like something will be invented at first. Obviously, originally, it's just the person who invented it using it. Mm. Then it's the person in his immediate vicinity using it. Then somebody invests in it. The next thing you know, you're seeing adverts for it. Before mm -hmm. you know it, it like... Every That's man and his dog human life. Is, is yeah. yeah. It's just it's just become assimilated, mm -hmm. and it's just, it would have been exactly the same. You would you would have seen it with like spears and stuff and stone tools. It's like okay, so the first the first state that figured it out is it would be cool in a way. I mean, obviously this is never going to happen, but imagine if we could find, we find out, out the who first the first one. That would be so almost cool. like the, the Albert Einstein of his day. Yeah, Do you know what I mean, yeah, like, literally, literally, yeah, like a genius breaking. That was almost like the start of all human innovation mm -hmm. because before that they would have been no different than any monkey in a tree today, essentially. Yeah. Do you know? I hope that that ape did like get its get its reward from that. Do you know? <laughs> what Definitely I mean? did. I hope mate. the other apes were like, you know what? We're gonna mm. we're gonna respect you because I'd like that. I'd like to think that they did, but I probably don't know. not. Probably not. Yeah, <laughs> but I do think it would have been cool to think that like you know, as I said, the same way that humans do it nowadays, or like even you know like you know for like uh, you're like getting into cooking, but you don't know how to cook. Uh -huh. And it's like, you know, you're watching somebody that does know how to cook, cook and then they're giving you like simple tips and advice on how to cook. And then all of a sudden, you know how to cook a banging meal. Mm. I can see it almost a bit like that. It would almost be like, you wouldn't know how to do this stuff. You know, you're a bit unsure on how to defend yourself when you're on the planes. You're a bit unsure about how to like hunt effectively without potentially hurting yourself. And then you just see some guy a couple of feet away from you. And he's just, you know, smoothing out this long branch, carving it into a point or tying this like like little shard of rock where he's made where he's like smashed like rocks together mm -hmm. into, 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 until he's got this nice little fine, almost like arrowhead. And they're just like, I, I, I'm going to copy that. Yeah. And then you're just doing it. And the next thing you can do it. And then someone's going to watch you do it. And then they're going to copy you. Mm -hmm. And so on and so on and so on. And then before you know it, you, it's almost like evolution happened. And the whole, entire, the whole entire <laughs> race is doing that. Yeah. And then they're looking at new ways to innovate. Another reason why they think that, um, obviously, what freed up a lot of time was because once humans invented fire... Um, cooking like unlocks a lot of nutrients and um, it's, it's it's one of those cool things and it's one of the reasons why you know I'm sure you've heard of like the raw vegan diet and stuff mm -hmm. and it's it's really stupid and gimmicky to be honest right um, no offence to any raw vegan out there but you know it's, it is like a pointless diet you know I think sort of like their almost childlike reasoning is like um, I don't know maybe thinking it's like more natural or right. something like that What's um, the difference between raw vegan and like normal normal so uh, a ve uh, just a vegan will still cook yeah. food Right, right, so they'll cook yeah, their food, of course, yeah. whereas a raw vegan only eats uncooked vegetation. Yeah, that's... Imagine eating a raw broccoli. Mental. Yeah. Apart from anything else, what you find in a lot of foods, um, and it's really common in things, especially like onions, like a lot of people are, are sensitive to onions, um, and also like to a lesser extent, but also, you know, more than a lot of other foods, tomatoes. Mm. Um, a lot of people are sensitive to things like tomatoes and onions. All right. Um, but if they're cooked, they, they're not... Right, right. So what what the cooking process does off, often is, um, you've got to think, from an evolutionary point of view, vegetation doesn't want to be eaten. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. As exactly. far as we're aware, it doesn't have feelings the same way that we have feelings. So it's mm -hmm. not like, if I just if something just came in and started eating you, it's not necessarily going to go like, ah, and like feel the yeah. pain, as, as far as we know anyway. But from an evolutionary standpoint, if they were just eaten to extinction overnight, mm -hmm. well, then they would have, every creature's on the planet's job is sort of simply to to carry on their their their, their existence, yeah. their, their their kind's existence. Mm -hmm. It's the whole reason why every animal on the planet, it's like main our main almost like strive is to just procreate. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's just to have more offspring, and it's this thing that's embedded in us all. Because if we don't, well, then we're all just going to die out, mm -hmm. which sort of makes the whole existence of our previous existence of our whole race almost like pointless. Yeah, and um. And obviously there's a myriad of reasons why um, creatures go extinct, whether it's their food source dries up, climate change, whatever. But mm -hmm. obviously, you know, ideally you want to be able to adapt with the times. Um, but, um, oh, where was I going? Oh, yeah. So animals, so, so sorry, plants, they have evolved to have things like deterrents in them mm -hmm. that make you not want to eat them raw. Yeah. So as I said, even things like broccoli, which when cooked are a very, you know, very nutritious food source. Mm -hmm. Like raw, they have sort of like toxins in, which if you eat enough of it, and obviously it becomes concentrated, it won't really do you much good. Yeah. And you say like raw onions, like I think raw onions are pretty delicious, but 
I say a lot of people just can't handle them. It gives people bad stomachs. Right. Um, and the same with tomatoes. I even know somebody that eating raw tomatoes gives them ulcers in their mouth. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But cooked tomatoes, fine. Not at all. And um, yeah, again, another thing. It's it's, it's not just even. Um, say in terms of like an upset stomach or anything like that or like ulcers it's like um say if you like you could eat like like red meat is safe to eat raw right but if you ate it raw it's quite tough mm-hmm. i mean which is ironic because also well done meat is also very tough and you get the sweet spot in the middle when it's sort of like when it's like rare medium rare medium uh-huh. but um if you just ate a big slab of red meat it'd be chewy it'd probably be quite tough horrible like, do you know what I mean? And it's and it would it would be harder for your stomach to to break it down. Yeah, for sure. If you eat like a deli- like a well, a really really um, you know, expertly cooked like rare, medium rare steak, nothing better. It's almost like melts in your mouth, man. And it's like your body, so it, your good. body almost like thanks you. It's like okay, so in that red meat, you know, red meat is super super nutritious. You know, it's full of B vitamins. It's a natural source of creatine. It's got um, um, complete proteins in, which means mm-hmm. you know um. It's got, you know, a wide variety of amino acids in it. You know, so many nutrients in red meat. Uh, I'm going to sneeze. Bless you. Thank you, man. <laughs> but you're giving it to your body in a way that your body can digest it really easily. Yeah. So your body's just like thanking you. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously there are some foods that you can eat, like like most fruits you can eat. Like, yeah. But you know what I mean? That you can I, eat, I said obviously. this to you recently, mm. didn't I? That fruits, weirdly, I think I've actually got like a weird allergy to some fruits oh, I'm not which apparently yeah. is is becoming like more i don't know if it's becoming more popular but mm. it is like quite a popular thing nowadays with like i yeah. get over like strawberries and stuff where if, i can eat yeah. a couple of them yeah but if i just ate loads of them i would start feeling like really weird my daughter was allergic to strawberries when she was really young and if she would eat them she would get like a red rash on her face yeah that's almost what yeah. i get it's yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. like almost being flushed you just feel really yeah, like you feel flushed wet. and hot yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's strange. Yeah, I mean, I think I think another thing is as well, is like everyone's, like most people are going to have certain food intolerances. Yeah, for sure. Like for whatever reason it is with me, it's like, um, like I really like peppers. Right. If I eat um, too many peppers, and I'm talking about cooked peppers, mm-hmm. you know, so not like, well, not raw peppers, I'm talking about cooked peppers. Like if I have, if I say I had them for three days in a row, right. by the third day I start having stomach pain. Really? Yeah. Huh. It's like, an, it's like accumulative. Yeah. You know, so once every now and again, it's okay. But I don't know what it is about peppers. It's, I think it's the only food with me. That's Any, funny. Anything else, anything else on the planet, I can digest fine. Mm. Um, I know, like, um, Drew, like, me and Drew used to have, like, a lot of curries together back when we were both, like, single guys and stuff like that, when we were bachelors, and we used to, like, hang around with each other, like, most Friday nights. We'd, mm-hmm. we'd often get a curry. And Drew's quite a sensitive soul <laughs> in many ways. But um, in his stomach, like, you know, um, like, he wouldn't be able to have, like, a hot curry. Because yeah. he said the next day he would just be, like... You know, on the toilet. Just, I remember like, how crying. much pain he was when we went to. Uh, oh, yeah, Fry Tucks. Tucks. Uh, yeah. Ruined him for a couple of days. Yeah, which um, for people <laughs> that aren't like sort of local to Bridgewater, Fry Tucks is like um, it's like a spicy chicken place, yeah, basically. So good. So um, good. But their but their spicy chicken is really spicy, uh-huh. like super spicy, guys. Like even for like you out there that are, like, oh no, I really like hot food. Like trust me, I like hot food too. Like I put Franks on pretty much everything, and I I like hot curries, but man, yeah, it's like next level. They've got like because I I went recently and I had like very hot. Which is like not the one, but they've they've got very hot, hot. They've got isn't it five plainish? Haven't they got five? Like um, isn't there five tiers? Is there five? Maybe or? that that sounds about right. I think it's they've five. Got, they've got three on the menu, don't they? They've got like normal hot. I usually and very just go hot. for medium because I'm past yeah. the age now. Like now I'm in my thirties. <laughs> you know I mean, I'm almost like past the age of it, just almost like testing it for the sake of it. Uh huh. Do you know what I mean? I like, actually really like it. I had I had this like very hot one the other day. Yeah. It was like a honey. Nice, like I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's like a bit fruity. I think honey, that's four, isn't it? But still really hot. It was, it was, it just said very hot. But then I know they've got ones yeah, that I aren't think, even I think, on the menu. I think you had the one that's like the next level up from medium. But I think it's worth saying that even the medium one's still hot, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure Drew only had medium when he was like crying yeah, and pooing. Yeah, definitely. Everywhere. Like literally, we had it and he was here, guys. I think we, I think it was even a day when we were doing a pod. And he just like kept having to go downstairs and he was just doing savage poos and it was horrible. Mm-hmm. And I remember I went downstairs like after he'd had a poo and it <laughs> just reeked down there. But it's so, like, you know, when it's like unhealthy mm-hmm. when it's like, because obviously, let's face it, right? Poo doesn't smell good. But, no. <laughs> but like, at least like, but this was like, you know, when you smell something and you're like, man, that that's like an unhealthy thing. Yeah. yeah like yeah, whatever's yeah. going on inside that person it's is not, not good. good. <laughs> like, like they need to go see, seek help. Like that's what it was like. Mm-hmm. And he, <laughs> and I just, we just kept doing horrible farts and everything. It was, oh man, yeah. But yeah, yeah. So Drew obviously has built up some kind of intolerance yeah. to hot food. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's just like digestive stuff in general. Like, there's a wide spectrum, isn't there? Some people can almost like like my old man. He can sort of like digest a car tire, mm. and then you can see at the other end of the spectrum someone like Drew. He's like, yeah, he's got quite sensitive stomach. You know, like he needs to stick to like milder stuff. But um, I love how we digressed from like you know why you <laughs> yeah, shouldn't from why raw, why food raw vegan. veganism <laughs> isn't as good for you as if you cook food to right through to like Drew having horrible poo. Yeah. Um, still with us in spirits, guys. But um. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, cooking your food unlocks nutrients. And going back to the Homo erectus thing, they think that, um, you know, because food, when you cook it, tends to be more nutritious, you know, Homo erectus created fire. They found out how to harness fire. They started cooking their food. Even that, though, it's almost like mental. Like, why did they start to think of cooking their food? Yeah. Like, but it's, it's it's cool. It makes it does make sense. And in fact, I have a theory. Um, well, it's not just my theory. I think other people have, have um, hypothesized this as well, which I'll cool. talk about in a little bit. But we need we need to go for a break in a second, so I'll talk about it in a minute. But yeah, Homo erectus created fire. They sort of combined this with their new sort of tools and stuff like that. They started cooking stuff. And it, what they, what happened is because the food they were eating started to be much more nutritious, it opened up time for them just to think. Mm. And they think that's what led to increasing brain size. Mm. So that's quite cool, isn't that it? That makes sense. Pandora's box is about to open wide. Um, but yeah, we were talking a little bit about Homo erectus um, before we went to that little break. And the reason, the main reason I wanted to like, bring up Homo erectus was um, because Homo erectus died out a very, very long time ago. I said it was the first uh, ape to stand upright. Um, obviously, it is our ancestor. If it wasn't for Homo erectus, we would not be here nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's quite cool is, is that um, when Java, when you could walk to the island of Java by land before it was sort of like, you know, became a, became a little island that was away from, from mainlands, um, a population of Homo erectus walked there. And while the rest of the world's population died off, the, home, the small population of Homo erectus on Java um, survived for like way, way, Whoa. way longer than any. So there was a small little population of them. And they think that people that live in Java to this day um, actually still have um, traces of Homo erectus DNA, which Whoa. is which is completely unique because nobody else on the, on the earth does. That's so cool. We talked a little bit about how Europeans have like, I think it's between 1% and 4% Neanderthal DNA. And um, that in some places of the world, um, I think it's like a... Um, I think it's in places of certain certain parts of Asia and maybe even parts of Russia, I think, um, have like Denisovian DNA, which was like a different, another type of of hominid. Obviously, there's lots of different types of of, of hominids, so several different ones. Um, Obviously, we we were the latest to evolve. Homo sapien was the latest to evolve. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I'm just going to read you this little article because I thought it was really interesting. Before you go into it, can I just ask, where was, where's Java? Um, Good question, my friend. Let's look (laughs) it up. Um, Let's look it up to be 100% sure. Java. Let's have a look. Java is Java on the map. <laughs> there we go. Let's have a look at this. And have a look. Let's have a look at this, then, folks. Oh, Indonesia. Oh, cool. So it's in the Indian Ocean. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so you see that. Yeah, so it's like uh, south of Borneo mm-hmm. and to the east of Sumatra and to the west, to the northwest of Australia. Cool. So that's cool, isn't it? That's nice. good to know. Nice, nice, nice. I can place it in my mind where they would have strolled off to you now. Yeah. I was going to say I thought it was Asia, but I didn't want to say in case I was wrong and then I'd yeah. look like a massive idiot. It's <laughs> <laughs> always the danger. That is always the danger, isn't it? So yeah, so that's that's where Java is, at, ladies and gentlemen. But it says, when seafaring modern humans, so homo sapiens, ventured onto the island of Java about 40,000 years ago, so already like you know a very, very long time ago, mm-hmm. They found a rainforest-covered land teeming with life, but they weren't the first humans to call this island home. Their distant ancestor, Homo erectus, had travelled to Java when it was connected to the mainland via land bridges and lived there for approximately 1.5 million years. These people made their last stand on the island about 100,000 years ago, which is really significant because 100,000 years ago, like relative to when Homo sapiens first evolved, is um, like super recent. Yeah. See, Homo sapiens evolved a very long time ago. I think it was, um, I think it was about two million years ago. Right. I want to say I think that's when the first Homo sapiens. So that was like, you know, so they lived a very long time. Mm. Um, Whereas I think to put it into perspective, you know, Homo sapiens have only been around for between two to three hundred thousand years. Right. So you know what I mean? So that's that's a long time that they 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 managed to hold out these people. 
Yeah, so um, long after they had gone extinct elsewhere in the world, according to a new study assigning re- reliable dates to previously found Homo erectus fossils, the findings suggest a trace of Homo erectus DNA could live on in modern Southeast Asian populations thanks to complex intermingling among the diverse humans who lived in the region. The newly dated fossils also bookend the existence of a remarkably long-lived human species, says Patrick Roberts, an archaeologist at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena, Germany, who wasn't involved with the study. With this date, the duration of Homo erectus occupation in Southeast Asia is nearly three times as long as our own species has been on the planet, he says. There is no doubt it was very successful. Homo erectus arose in Africa about 1.9 million years ago. So yeah, about 2 million right. years ago. Um, these toolmakers were relatively, had relatively large brains. They migrated out of Africa and across Asia, crossing into Java by land bridges about 1.6 million years ago. So that's, yeah, it's really impo- um, impressive, isn't it? So they walked there at 1.6 million years ago, and they were there as recently as 100,000 years ago. Damn. When savannah-like open woodland covered much of the land, later sea levels rose, isolating this ancient, these ancient Javans on the island. Meanwhile, in Africa and mainland Asia, Homo erectus disappeared over half a million years ago. So he survived on for like 400,000 years more than any other Homo erectus population, which if you think about it, is is, is longer than our species has even been around. I wonder if at any point during that period, they would have branched off and explored into the rest of the world or if they literally just stayed well, no, in Well no because they were they were locked into the island oh, right. and they never like invented boats or anything so right. by that point obviously yeah Java was just an island so they were like stuck on the island oh, it was probably one of the reasons obviously they survived because yeah. they weren't um, susceptible well they, were, they weren't in competition with any other hominid or mm-hmm. I guess they became this nice little isolated but like they just happy, sort of had their own land yeah just yeah. had this little island which was like their island Homo erectus island erectus island you cool. could call it cool <laughs> the island of erections <laughs> In the 1930s, a team of Dutch explorers excavated a site by Java's Solo River near the village of Nyangdong. (laughs) Nyangdong, named after the great Homo erectus. Mm, An erectus island. (laughs) They unearthed a rare trove of fossils, tens of thousands of animal bones, and 12 partial skulls with two leg bones identified as Homo erectus. But the Dutch team couldn't date the bones with any certainty. Later, scientists also struggled, despite more sophisticated dating methods. Because these material, because these require material from the same sediment layers as the fossils, and nobody knew exactly where the original excavation took place. Ah, oh, it's a bit annoying, isn't it? Yeah, I was going to say that's a bit of a shame. The fossils had been an enigma, says the new studies lead author, paleoanthropologist Russell Kreichon, on the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Many people had tried to date them, but there was no way to accurately do so. Um, o. Frank Huffman, an archaeologist at the T- University of Texas in Austin and a study co-author spent five years poring over the Dutch explorer's photos and notes, even met with their grandchildren. He and colleagues deduced that the 1930s excavation was located near what is now a sugarcane field abutting a dirt road. In 2008 and 2010, Kaikon's team re-excavated the site, turning up 867 new fossils belonging to a mixture of deer, wild cattle, and an extinct elephant-like animal called a stegodon. Cool. I've um, seen pictures of them before. They do look pretty nuts. Was that the first place that they found them then? What? Or the Stegodon? Is this like a um, new discovery or do you reckon this was like they already knew about the Stegodon? I'm just not sure, mate. Bit? But I'll get a quick picture up for people that are watching on um, uh, YouTube and, and uh, Spotify. Mm-hmm. So this was a Stegodon. Damn, look at those tusks. That's cool. Stegodon, there you go. A larger species of Asian mainland Stegodon. Okay, so I think what it's I think it was like the the um, species on Java was probably a bit smaller. I right, imagine. right, right. Yeah, look, you see Stegodon. Um, oh, this the one looks one. pretty freaking massive, actually. Bigger than a mammoth. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? We'll have to look in more in more depth into a Stegodon mm. in the future. But look at those tusks, baby. Yeah, man. That's crazy. An impressive animal, regardless. Definitely. Um. Yeah, cool. So that would have been an, an, a hell of a cool find, wouldn't it? Based on phot- photographs and documents from the original excavation, they established that some of the newly found animal fossils came from the same rich bone bed as the Homo erectus fossils. The researchers applied five types of radiometric dating, including a new method that provides both minimum and maximum dates to those animal fossils and the sediments around them. The team concluded that the bones were buried between 117,000 and 108,000 years ago. So there we have it. So 
that those Homo erectus fossils are between 108 to 117,000 years old. Damn. But um, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's, it goes on to say it's doubtful they lived much longer. Homo erectus, that is. Um, a warmer, wetter climate turned Java's open woodlands into dense rainforests about 100,000 years ago. And Kaikon suggests Homo erectus would have struggled to survive in such a transformed landscape. When modern humans arrived on Java apparently about 40,000 years ago, Homo erectus was probably already extinct. Probably. That's so cool that they let, that they lasted for that long. Yes, yeah, super Just cool. on this island. It'd almost be like, imagine if like, imagine if like you just found that there was a little island somewhere. I mean, obviously it's dinosaurs went extinct way mm. longer ago than Homo erectus. But imagine if you just found out that there was a little island somewhere with like a dinosaur on it. Yeah, exactly. Like and a little it's small just like one population. that's been trapped off from the rest of the world. And there's just been a little small population. Just enough that they can carry on mating. Mm -hmm. But that'd be like super cool, wouldn't Man, it? Man, I'd love that. Love that. It would be amazing. It would be amazing. I do hear like, you know, every now and again, they do find like an animal that they think has been extinct for like, like a hundred years or something and then mm. they'll just find it. In fact... No, that's just reminded me. I saved something on... Um, I actually just screenshotted something the other day because I thought it was really cool. They've just found what they thought was... Um, um, they thought the largest um, species of bee had gone extinct and then they've just found it again. Cool. In Indonesia. Oh, man, I'm excited to see this because I like bees. Yeah, bees are cool. Bees, I always think, are actually a lot bigger than I think they are in my depending, head. Whenever well, depending I see, on the bee. Well, yeah, whenever There's I see like a bees. bumblebee. Yeah. Oh, they're bigger. They're huge. They're big old things. They're huge. They are massive. Big, like, fluffy, cuddly, cool things, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, exactly. And I really like honey as well, so thank God for the for the humble bee. Mm -hmm. But yeah, let's um, Google this. So the, the type of bee is called the, um, I believe it's called the Mega Chili Pluto. Cool. Um, it's cool the world, name. and then literally the article just says, world's largest, it's, it's, it's this, um, uh, this, this site I follow called Big Think Science. Cool. And obviously they just follow all the biggest scientific breakthroughs and stuff like that. And it literally just says, world's largest bee thought to be extinct, found alive in Indonesia. Nice. And then it shows a picture of it. This it, They've got it in like a little cool tube. So let's mm -hmm. have a look. Mega Chili Pluto. Uh, let's Mega have a Chili look. Pluto. Mega Chili Pluto. Wallace's giant bee. Let's have a look. So. Damn, look at the size of it compared to a different bee. Yeah, man. So this was this is the largest bee in the world. And as I said, a real nice story, really. Nice news, everybody. Mm. Good news. What Good a nice news. way to say, you know, on a Monday, kicking off your week. And this is the this is the the one that was just being found. So this is the guy because this isn't the the, the picture from the article. So th they found it alive, called in scientists, and they've they've caught one. I guess they're probably going to do it to try and make sure that the the, the species can now yeah, carry on. Sure. They'll, they'll put it into like you know conservation efforts and stuff like that. But yeah, found alive and well, once feared extinct, rediscovered in Indonesia. So everybody, yep, as I said, good news. The world's largest bee. Is not it's extinct. not dead. It's still out there. Nice. And yeah, look at the size of that compared to a honeybee. Man, that's crazy. That I wonder is... what its job is. Dude, look at the look at the gnarly mandibles yeah. on that, dude. Almost like it's like it reminds that's me a almost beast. Almost looks almost like a crossbreed between like a giant ant and like uh -huh. a bee. Do you know what I mean? Because something about the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. So Man. that's a drawing depiction of the difference between like a I guess like you know the sort of honeybee we have in the UK or whatever, and then the mega chili Pluto. That is pretty crazy. It's the mandibles, dude. Mm. Isn't it? Because like bees in our country don't have these crazy mandibles. It's a bit like beetle-like, isn't it? Yes, very beetle-like, I'd say. But yeah, look at that. That's a real picture of one Damn. on some mud. That is World's cool. Like, yeah. Filmed alive in the wild. Let's see if there's any videos of it, shall we? Mm. Quickly. It's quite creepy looking, you know? I know what you mean. It does look quite creepy, doesn't it? I think, it's, as I said, I think it's something about the mandibles. Mm. It's a bit like alien like. Yeah, for sure, man. Here we go. Uh, we've been searching for four days now in the North Moleccas, and we stumbled across this nest and found the perfect nest entrance and waited, and here's our prize. Cool, isn't it? Pincers. That's cool. I wonder if they're like, um, like dangerous. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wonder if, like, you know. If they like, use it to, like, bite people. Yeah, like, could it bite you or, like, you know, has it got a nasty sting? I read the other day that bees sting each other. Like, they actually use their stingers as, like. To, I thought that if bees sting, though, I thought if they sting each other, then they die. They do. But, like, uh, I read a well, thing. Well, they just do it anyway. Yeah, I read die. a thing about, like, 
each hive will have like guard bees. Mm. And if they think that other bees are coming to their hive to like steal the nectar, mm. they'll just set the guard bees up and the guard bees will just like sting the other bees that are coming to steal their nectar, almost like doing a kamikaze mission. Yeah, they are like samurais. How crazy is yes. that? All of our, like any Japanese listeners out there are like, mm-hmm. it's Yeah. <laughs> Honor before death. <laughs> death before dishonor, man. Yeah. But That's no, it's, cool. it's quite cool. It says here that the last one that was seen alive was in 19, where was it? Is it 85? No, 81. So that's quite a long time, really. King of the bees. I mean, bearing in mind, that's like, what, 40 years? Over over 40 years? Yeah. 42 years? So that's quite cool. 42 so think years. what else could be out there that people just don't even think exists anymore. <laughs> mm. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, you could have a field day wondering about these things. Mm-hmm. But I remember, you know, when um, I remember, I mean, this has been discovered quite a long time ago, but they remember that people found fossils of this fish called the celiacanth. Um, and they... They were dated from literally like the the, the dinosaur period, so a, a paleontologists figured it was a fish that was around during the time of the dinosaurs and that had died out like literally millions and millions and millions of years ago, mm-hmm. and then they just casually just found one in a river in Africa. Whoa! Yeah, that's sick. I'll show you that's a picture. Really Seely, cool. I don't know how it's spelled. Um, C. Uh... So it's literally essentially. Well, it is just like finding an animal from the dinosaur period still roaming about. Yep, here it is. That's so there cool. It is. So, um, yep, Celia counts are a fish belonging to the order of Ac- Ache- sorry, Act in Nistia that includes two extant species in the genus Latimeria. The West Indian Ocean Celia counts primarily, primarily found near the Comoro Islands off the east coast of Africa and the Indonesian Celia counts. So <laughs> the one I'm talking about must be that first one. What is it about Indonesia <laughs> and having all these different places? That is a very good question. I was thinking that myself. But yeah, look, we've got some pictures there. We've got some African scientists looking yeah. over them. And they're massive fish, as you can see, and they look very prehistoric. I was going to say, it almost looks a bit like dragon scale. It, it looks like something that would be around during the time of the dinosaurs. Well, like, it was very common back in the... Look at the size of it, man, compared to five fully grown <sighs> dudes. But um, yeah, it was very common back in the dinosaur period. A lot of fish had sort of like armor plates. Mm-hmm. You see that with um, one of the most fearsome fish of all time was called Dunkleosteus. Mm-hmm. It was a terrifying fish, mate. Have you mm-hmm. seen it? Have you ever seen a picture I of it? I think I know the one you're Have we talked about, about it on the pod before? Perhaps. Don't Cleosteus. Perhaps, yeah. But it was a terrifying fish, mate. I know the one with like the art pretty much just wearing armour. Yeah. Yeah. It was just covered in like bony, and it would have been like, felt like bone. Yeah. Like, if you tap, it was like bone plated exoskeleton. That's crazy, isn't um, it? And it was this like really massive fish with um, just scary jaws, and it was like an evil fish. Like, yeah. if, like it was one of those <laughs> fish that like. If um had bad intentions. If you were living if you were like if you were swimming in the in the in the seas during the time that that, that it was alive, it would have, like a hundred percent have eaten you if right, it saw you. Like right, that sort right. of thing, you know? Like just a sketchy, sketchy creature. But um Damn. Yeah, look, Celiacanth, the fish that outdid the Loch Ness monster, <laughs> Natural History Museum. So yeah, it's a pretty cool story, really, isn't it? I think that people thought that this fish died out literally back in the dinosaur period and it's mm. just still alive. I do Casually. like that it does look quite dinosaur. Yeah, look, it says here, look, celiacanths, this is from the Natural History Museum website. Celiacanths were so- thought to be extinct for 70 million <sighs> years until one was found alive in 1938. <laughs> How crazy period, is that? That what is nuts. Period. I mean, I quite like the comparison to the Loch Ness Monster as, as well, because I guess it is the whole thing of like, I mean, one of the theories of the Loch Ness Monster is that it's like a a one like a plesiosaur survived yeah. and somehow it's like just living in Loch Ness um, whereas obviously yeah this is actually is a, a creature that was found alive in the 20th century <laughs> that literally was was thought to have died out in the dinosaur period yeah. and then was just casually found I just get casually how found. creepy it looks I think it's because the amount of fins like, well, like yes yeah, it's, it's very fins. prehistoric I yeah. think I think in general sort of fish from the dinosaur period looked a bit more scary and it might have just purely been because there were more horrible things that could have eaten them yeah. so I guess it's like the, the the worse the predator the worse the prey has to be that makes to sense. fend off the predators do you know what I mean it's like the more intimidating the prey has to look because it was like if you just look like an innocent little bunny rabbit yeah. then like everything's just going to come and destroy you isn't it yeah for sure but yeah pretty cool <laughs> isn't it I like that that's cool but yeah, I mean, who knows what the next animal, is, as you said, is like, because let's face it, so, sooner, sooner or later, they're going to find another animal that people think are extinct. Yeah. That's just going to be found alive again. And it's just pretty cool to think like, 
you know, oh, what what animal was that going to be? What could it be? Yeah. What's that going to be? What is out there hiding somewhere in like the depths of a jungle or yeah. out in the Indonesian sea? <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, man, hundred percent. So that's really cool. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, guys, I think we're going to take a, another real short break now, and then we're going to go into uh, this week's mystery Mondays. Oh. I'm going to have like four short tales for you. Um, four of the supposedly um, most creepy and mysterious paranormal tales in British history. So get ready. Welcome back, everybody. It is time for the darkness to take hold, for Mystery Mondays is upon us. The talk of the daylight hours is gone. No more shall we talk about giant bees and Homo erectus. Or other things. Or or weightlifting ladies (laughs) and Mm. running ladies. Now it is time to talk about mysterious tales from the nether regions. Mm. Uh, uh. So yeah, I'm going to bring you um, four supposedly true short stories. Four of the most um, horrific. Nice. Mysterious tales of the paranormal ever to take place in the UK. And as I said, apparently... These are all all true. To or our at least, least knowledge, or at least real. something happened, I guess. Where the, the, the question is, and this is the mystery, mm. was it a paranormal entity or was it something that could be explained? Regardless of, of which um, is true, the people experiencing them were terrified um, and these are their tales. I'm excited for this. I love stuff like this. Oh, mate. Just nice little story. I know. Uh-huh. It's great, isn't it? Great. So the first one is known as the North Fleet Horror. Mm. In 1962, in the town of Northfleet, some 20 miles southeast of London, an ordinary three bedroomed terraced house was the scene of a terrifying case of haunting. 28 year old Sidney Maxted and his wife, together with their children, Kevin, six, Linda, four, and baby Cly, moved into 16 Waterdales prior to the family taking up residence. The house had no history of paranormal activity. So they moved into number 16, Waterdale's prior. And as I said, prior to them moving in, this house had no history whatsoever Mm -hmm. of anything paranormal happening. During their tenancy, Mrs. Maxted gradually became concerned about the noises she heard during the daytime, which came from the bedroom which was above the living room. Uh oh. The sounds seemed to be footsteps pacing back and forth across the room floor. Nice. Sometime later, events took on a particularly sinister nature when the Maxted children began to complain of scratching noises which came from under their beds at night. Imagine how horrible That's that would be. That's actually terrifying, man. I mean, even even as an adult, that would, that would be horrible, let alone yeah. as like a little child. So yeah, the Maxter children began to complain of scratching noises which came from under their beds, and he also complained that their beds' covers were being yanked away in the darkness. Oh, that's hot. See, for me, that's even worse than the scratching. Imagine being in bed, man, and you hear scratching. That's bad enough. Imagine if it was like slow, it'd be even freakier. Like if it was like oh. quick, that would obviously be horrible. But imagine just a slow little tug. But just sat there, just like shivering. Not just that, as time carried on, they even started to be mysteriously pulled from their beds and were even struck by what they described as invisible hands. Damn. So they actually got, like, punched and slapped and stuff. That's crazy. I think there's something about a duvet. Like, being under a duvet seems like such a safe space, space, doesn't it? Yeah, even though you know it's just cloth. Yeah. So, so to have that so taken weird. away, you're instantly like out in the exposed. open. Exposed. Yeah. Your little, your, your little Jimmy's exposed. Yeah. Soon, matters came to a head. One night, at about 2am, Mrs. Maxted went to attend to baby Claire. On returning to bed, she looked across to the door and was surprised to see a figure in the form of a young child enter her room. <sighs> Mrs. Maxted, of course thinking it was her six-year-old daughter, responded automatically and exclaimed, Linda. The form then moved across the room and advanced towards her. As it approached, however, it seemed to grow in height, almost astonishingly, until it had become 
a grotesquely tall figure which bent menacingly over the bed. Uh. Mrs. Maxted's terrified screams woke her husband, and the apparition then vanished. Regardless of whether you think this tale is true, and regardless of whether it actually happened or not, this harrowing experience proved too much for the family to bear, and the very next day, they left the house. Forever. Good on them. Good on them. Fair play. Yeah, because I think, you know, it's always frustrating sometimes in horror movies, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You see, this horrible stuff starts happening, and you think, why don't go, you just go. move? <laughs> just move house. Like, I don't even care by this point if you have to, like, stay on your parents' like sofa for, like, mm-hmm. a year. Just get out of that house, man. Like, so, That's th- a, so many times you hear that same thing, don't you? Of yeah. them just t- staying a bit too long. So it's actually really nice to hear. Yeah. If, if if some kid comes up to you in the hallway and grows grotesquely <laughs> tall and menacing, and like, like looming, <laughs> <laughs> the bed, yeah. it's time to get out. Yeah, of that just house. leave, mate. It's sleep, time to go sleep. at that point. So fair play. And then I think you know you could just put you know because if that was just an isolated event, that'd be bad enough. But the yeah. fact that the kids. Described being <laughs> beaten up and like dragged and like, out their bed and like h- horrible menacing scratching noises coming from under the bed and then like all hours yeah. of the day the woman could just hear footsteps walking around like the bedroom over the living room mm-hmm. that, like that's that's weird mate I'd be curious to know what happened to the house afterwards like if they yeah, sold the know. house to someone we should, else we should try and find out demolished. at the end once I finished all these stories um, we'll do a little follow up and we'll quickly try mm. and find out what happened to um, to the house number sixteen Waterdale's prior. Mm-hmm. So the next story is simply called The Floating Head. Cool. The floater, if you were. The floater, yeah. (laughs) The Theatre Royale in Margate is one of Britain's oldest stages. It was built in 1786, and over the centuries has seen many illustrious thespians tread its boards. However, it has also gained another reputation. It is said to be one of the most haunted theatres in the country. Many of Britain's theatres can boast a resident ghost. Most seem to be of the benevolent kind, and stick to vaguely appearing in the stalls or walking through walls, phenomena which would appear to be non-threatening. However, not all theatre ghosts are so benign. Mm. In 1966, Alfred Tanner was contracted to decorate the auditorium of the Royale. To minimise any inconvenience to the running of the theatre, the work was to be carried out in the dead of night. During Tanner's first night, he reported hearing the soft whisperings of voices talking to him throughout the auditorium. Oh, bad That'd start. Be... Bad start. <laughs> Alfred. <laughs> Alfred Tanner. He explored the building to find the source of these voices, but could find absolutely no reason for the sounds. On the second night, he again heard the soft whisperings throughout the stalls. Mm. At one point, he was made to jump with alarm when the booking office door suddenly slammed hard shut. Mr. Tanner was now becoming a little bit concerned. Mm. He tried to take his mind off the strange sounds by concentrating on the work that he had to do. Yet, as he stood on the stage, he heard footsteps slowly walk across and then stop right behind him. Oh, that's horrifying, man. (laughs) That's so bad. Mate, it's bad, isn't it? I think it makes it even worse that he's on the stage. Yeah. Like, he is like the... I think it's like the dead of night. Yeah. And he's alone in this massive theatre. And he's already heard... He's he's probably already, like, got his hairs on end, standing on end, because he's heard whispers, weird whispers, and the door slammed shut and... See, before that, I'd be creeped out, but I'd be like, oh, you know, there'd be so- I'd try and, like, justify it, but as soon as something's, like, creeping up behind me, I'd be like, nah. Especially because it describes it as, as, as slow footsteps. That's, uh-huh. like, more menacing. If it was fast, it would almost take the edge off, but it's like... Yeah. And you're, like, you're looking around, you see nothing behind you, and it's just getting closer. Oh, man. Yeah, that's horrible, mate. Um, indeed, he had the most unpleasant feeling that there was someone standing right behind him. He turned around quickly, but the stage was deserted. Tanner was contemplating if he should just abandon the job, leave and go home. The atmosphere in the theatre had become so unsettling and full of dread that he simply could barely carry on. Mm -hmm. Two more incidents 
prompted him to do so. As he continued working, he heard a backstage door slam heavily. He spun round and was terrified to then see a disembodied head (sighs) appear from behind the curtains on the left side of the stage. It came floating towards him and Tanner was horrified to see that it was the shoulders and head of a woman with frizzy hair who had slits for eyes and a receding chin. It moved past him and disappeared into the curtains at the other side of the stage. This was the point where Tanner had had enough. Yeah. He fled from the theatre, never to return. Once again, fair play. Yeah. And you know what? Yeah. That once again adds more credence to yeah. the story for me because I don't. If if he was to have just stayed there, I'd be yeah. like, why would you stay there? But it's just straight up horror that, movie. You gotta go. Oh yeah, you gotta go, man. You gotta, you gotta go. go. You gotta go. So now we move on to our third tale, mm-hmm. ladies and gentlemen, and this one is called. This is probably one with the most uh, freaky title, in my opinion. Okay. The Crawling Woman. Ooh, that's a bit creepy. A Darchy lod, Lodge stood on the shores of Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands. Mm. In December of 1952, Peter McEwen and his wife Dorothy moved in with plans to turn the land to farming. Some months later, they advertised for a housekeeper and a farmhand to help out with the expanding farm. The ad was answered by a couple called MacDonald, who were taken on and given accommodation at the lodge. It was soon after their arrival that Mrs. MacDonald began to hear disembodied footsteps moving about the house at night. She reported her experiences and concern to the McEwans. They listened with interest, but reassured the housekeeper, saying it was probably just the creaks and knocks of an old building settling down in the cool air of the evening. Yet, Mrs. MacDonald continued to hear the unnerving sounds. Curiously, neither her husband nor the McEwans heard anything strange at all. The housekeeper, however, insisted that she could hear the footsteps and she believed them to be the ghost of an old woman. The McEwans would have none of it and put it to the MacDonald that was all in her mind. But one night, things came to a terrifying climax. Before retiring to bed, the housekeeper went to the kitchen door, which led out onto a long hallway. As she opened the door and looked out, she saw the apparition of an old woman by the stairs. Mm. The figure, menacingly, was on her hands and knees and began to crawl slowly towards her. Oh. That's proper like the grudge. Like the from, yeah, the that's ring. what I was going to say, you know, from the ring. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The terrified Mrs. MacDonald says she couldn't discern any clear features. Yet... She said the wraith seemed barely human as it began to crawl closer. The housekeeper slammed the kitchen door and fled to her husband. The next day, they both left the house. A Darchy Lodge stood until 1968, when it was demolished by the UK Army. Mm. Despite its demise, its reputation as the house of the crawling woman was forever sealed. I think it's like a cool little um, ending that the house was just demolished by the yeah, UK Army. Yeah, I like that. Because I'm sure there's probably like a like a like an innocent explanation, but it sort of makes you go, why? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why, what, like, I've what, always got this like what, image what of like do? UK tanks just surrounding it and just like uh-huh. blowing it. Because <laughs> they had like, they knew something that we didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is creepy. We are now on to our final tale of nice. this week's Mystery Mondays, ladies and gentlemen. And this one in a very sinister manner, is called The Suicide Room. In the summer of 1967, 18-year-old Linda Adam was offered a place at Manchester University to study English. At the time, there was a shortage of accommodation on the university campus, and the new student was required to take lodgings in a Victorian house, which had been converted to flats on the edge of the city. The bedsit was a small affair with a bedroom, a tiny kitchen, 
and a bathroom. It was furnished with a single bed, a table, some chairs, and a rather large, rather gloomy looking wardrobe, which stood in the corner. Mm. Linda soon settled into her new lodgings and made friends with her fellow students. However, some weeks later, she began to wake in the middle of the night to hear the sound of heavy breathing in her room. <laughs> Once again, bad day all round. Heavy breathing is a really menacing sound to wake yeah, up to in the dead of night. Definitely. Just picture it. I don't it's think pitch there's black. many things that are worse. You wake up, it's it's one of those things, you know when you like wake up in the middle of the night and you literally you have no idea what time it is? Mm-hmm. You literally don't have a clue. All you know is it's pitch black in All your you room. All you know is it's you're, night. And you're, yeah. discon- you're really discombobulated because you were so deep in sleep, whether you wake up to go for a wee or something like that. Mm-hmm. And imagine just hearing... In a room that's already, like, you've, you've already described house. as quite creepy. It had, like, a gloomy-looking wardrobe. Yeah, an old Victorian house that was converted into flats mm-hmm. for the university, yeah. <laughs> she recalls it was not the sound that a man would make, but rather the rapid inhaling and exhaling of a child in great distress. <laughs> yeah. Like that. Yeah, that's a good one. Good one, but good. Alarmed... She immediately switched on her bedside lamp, but the room was empty, and the sounds immediately ceased. Mm. The sounds of the heavy breathing occurred only intermittently afterwards. Yet there was one other strange occurrence which puzzled her. Each morning, she awoke to find the door of the bulky wardrobe standing open. That's... uh, Do you know what? That's horrible. That's awful. (laughs) Almost like there's something living in there, mate. Man, waking up with the, <laughs> it over. Oh. And the fact that, like, from the moment she walked in, her initial thing was like, "This is a nice place, but cool. That wardrobe's really mm-hmm. creepy." And it's the creepy wardrobe. I couldn't keep that. There's no way. It's almost like the wardrobe was haunted or something. Yeah. No matter how she secured the door at night before she went to sleep, it would always be swung back, even when she tried to keep it shut by leaning heavy objects against it. <sighs> Linda began to become more concerned about the wardrobe when she discovered a key to the door and locked it. Yet even with this, in the morning, much to her alarm, she found the door open and the key lying on the floor on the opposite side of the room. The student now seriously considered moving out of the bedsit, but she knew that might jeopardise her place at the university. A few nights later, the decision was made for her. She had been out with friends and returned to her bedsit after midnight. She was tired and went straight to bed. She cannot recall the time she was awoken in the small hours by the same rapid breathing she had heard when she had first moved in. <laughs> nice, but There you go. <laughs> Leaning over to the bedside table, she felt for the light switch but the light did not come on when she pressed the button. Sitting up, she looked through the darkness over to the wardrobe. The door was open. Oh, man. This is incredibly well written, must I say, by the way. That's horrifying. (laughs) Much to her terror, Linda could just make out the shape of a figure standing inside the wardrobe. The young woman was now paralysed with fear as she saw someone slowly step out of the wardrobe and move towards her bed. It was all too much for the terrified girl, and with one swift movement, she leapt from the bed and ran screaming out of her front door to her fellow students. After this, Linda unsurprisingly moved out of the room immediately not even caring about her place at Manchester University. Mm -hmm. She was later to discover that she wasn't the only student to experience the phenomena. It was a sad tale. Five years earlier, a young female student had been allocated the bedsit. Her anxiety about completing her studies and gaining a degree plagued her night and day. 
she was a chronic asthmatic and suffered with crippling depression and hallucinations. One morning, she didn't show up for a lecture. Her friends became concerned when she had been absent for a week. The university authorities had to force the bedsit door. Inside, the poor girl was found, dead inside the wardrobe. She had slit her wrists. After the experience of Linda Adam, the wardrobe was removed from the room Good. and burned. Good. And that's, that's, that's the end of the stories. That's crazy that... Um, that's a really well-written... Yeah, well written tale, hell, by like, the yeah. Way. Uh, yeah, I, I think was, out yeah. of all of the ones, that was the one that almost had me most on the edge of my seat. Like, it was oh, like... It was... Um, it's like hearing a... Like, yeah, like a good ghost story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a well-written ghost story. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that was really cool. Really, all stories are really interesting, though, don't you think? Really, really good. Do you know what? That's actually probably one of my favourite mysteries because it's just fun to sit here and listen. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, hundred percent. I agree with you, man. It's like fun for me to, to read them out and to, and to hear them myself. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, I think the cool stories as well because you know, there's just four completely unrelated tales mm-hmm. from within the UK that are all, you know. As far as the people that experience them are concerned, 100% true. Yeah. And I think there are some things about it that make it really intriguing. So, like, with the last one, obviously, that Linda, the lady who was the protagonist in our last tale, uh-huh. obviously, you know, talks about how she woke up in the middle of the night and hearing, like, uh, like frantic breathing that sounded like almost like raspy childlike breathing mm. and all this stuff, seeing the figure in the wardrobe, etc. But she found out after that she moved out and then yeah. found out after about the woman that was in there that committed suicide mm-hmm. and that had the asthma, which yeah. would experience, which would explain the <laughs> mm-hmm. the weird frantic, you know, almost like rushed, hurried breathing. Yeah. So that makes you go, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's, so that's a bit of credence. That's a bit it? weird. And yeah. then the fact that almost like um, whether you put it down to like superstitious nonsense or whatever, the fact that after that. Um, I guess, like, whoever owned the building, like, whoever in the university or whatever, mm. removed the wardrobe and burnt it. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though, if I was a, if I was a landlord, superstitious mm. interference there, folks. Um, <laughs> they're trying to silence Yeah, you. sorry, supernatural, superna- <laughs> supernatural technical interference there, guys. Yeah, the, the ghosts don't want me to talk about this. The spirits from beyond. Mm. But yeah, if I was, like, if I was a landlord and, um, say, I, like, renovated a Victorian house and there was, like, one piece of pretty like good condition furniture yeah that i decided i would leave as like a nice cool little like you know you know because it was like an old school yeah, piece from yeah, original yeah. Bit like, of an homage to the yeah actual yeah exactly house yeah itself. so i'd like leave it in there if i found out that like one of my tenants had that experience and then like you know and then like the one before had like killed themselves like in that piece of furniture whatever yeah. it was I'd probably remove it and freaking oh, burn it. Oh, a hundred percent. And I'm. Do you know I'd be surprised? It seems I'm like surprised bad juju. that um it didn't get burnt like when the initial incident mm. happened. Do you know what I mean? I feel like if if I don't know. I feel like if I was whoever was in charge of this piece of furniture mm. and I knew someone had you know just killed themselves and mm. went into this wardrobe, I'd get rid of the wardrobe. The thing is though, I mean, you say that, and like I do obviously ag- like agree with you essentially, mm. but. Obviously, living in a country like the UK, think about how many old buildings we have. We do have a lot of new builds, um, but we also have lots of very, very old houses in the UK. Mm -hmm. And it's if you're living in a house which is, say, more than 100 years old, or maybe even less, you you can almost guarantee, and guarantee past a certain age of house, that people have died in that house. Yeah, true. In, in, In a vast variety... Of, of circumstances and places, mm-hmm. as the current owner or, or tenant, you don't know where someone's died in that yeah, house. It yeah, could be yeah, your yeah. favourite spot in the house, and somebody might have hung themselves there, might uh-huh. have died um, in, in any in any manner of ways. You know, also other things as well. Like you don't know how abusive a household might have been before you you entered it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? There might have been like a really like abusive. Circumstance in there. Do you know what I mean? It's just it's not quite, like you get like a yeah. rundown of everything. That's no, happened exactly. In the house but it's like, but it. what I'm getting at is, in there'll be a lot of houses which have dark histories, yeah, and dark paths and different stuff. Did I tell you about? I think I, I think I did. And I? I told you about my my grandmother finding that skull in her wall. Mm, um, I think I'm pretty sure I told you. Indeed, maybe on one of the pods. Maybe. But yeah, she was having some building work done on the downstairs of her house. And um, she lives in like a really old farmhouse. I think it's originally dated to like it's at least 400 years old. Right. 
And um, yeah, she was having some building work done, and they were removing some old bricks, and they found a human skull in the wall. Oh my god! And she's like quite religious, my grandmother. Yeah. Like you know, she's a Christian, and um, she was so freaked out, and she didn't know what to do, and, and she just um, asked them just to like board it up. So there's still just a human skull in, in the house. And it's funny as well, because I was like, oh, no, I reckon she should have burnt it. Mm. And then I spoke to Claire, who's on Bullwinkle's um, Tuesday, you know, Tarot Tuesday uh-huh. show, who's a clairvoyant and um, lots of... Psychic lots of, yes, medium. Yes, 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 yes. And she actually told me that my grandmother did the right thing. Apparently, right. if she listened to my advice and she removed it, it could have been, like, really bad juju. I was going to say, because that is a bad... Like, that would be... If that happened to me, yeah. I would definitely have a hard time going... Do you just take it away? Yeah. Or do you leave it there? and Because you don't want to mess with it, do you? you don't but I always like... feel like whatever you do, it's like horrible. Yeah. Because yeah. ever since, because um, my grandmother has um, has trouble sleeping at night. She just always has done. Right. Um, so she's always the last one awake in her household. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, let's face it, sometimes late at night, you might be a bit parched. She's like a, she's a big reader. So she sort of sits in her room a lot of the night, sort of with a bedside lamp on, like reading and stuff. And sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, let's face it, you get thirsty or something. Yeah. So she said, and she always used to like go down to the kitchen to get like a drink, but she has to pass the wall um, that has the human skull in to, to get to the kitchen. And she's been like too scared to. No. Yeah. She's too scared to. Yeah, in the middle of the night, just like knowing. And, and it's like so many questions. It's like, who's the owner of the skull? Mm. Why is the skull there? Mm-hmm. Where's the body? Is the body or somewhere else in the house or like also in the wall? So many unknowns. There like, is, what, like you said, like, there was, is so many questions. Was it there? a murder? Mm-hmm. Was it was it some sort of like occult black magic like satanistic? You just like That's satanist, horrible. mate. That's yeah, horrible. satanist. Sorry, not satanist. Yeah, but like yeah, um, just crazy man. So yeah, That's shout out to my poor grandmother. Yeah. She's a lovely woman as well. Really oh, lovely woman. Not like, deserving of it. I mean, she's like you know she's the sort of person like legit like um you know she's like sent like she's the sort of person that, like sends money like over abroad to like like um um disadvantaged children and stuff. Yeah, it's like people she doesn't even know. Yeah. Like one of those people that always like thinks the best of everyone. Uh huh. Like, um, she used to be a primary school teacher in Spaxton, um, back in like the like the sixties and seventies. And like every night, like I've met like a couple of people, bumped into a couple of people over the years that are like now obviously adults. I'm like, oh what, you're you're Mrs. Bryant's grandson? Like, yeah. And they're like, just just let her know that she's like my favourite teacher, and that. And she was like, oh, always nice. really sad. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So like, what I'm getting across is she's like such a nice lady. Yeah, yeah. And it yeah. seems like such a shame yeah. that she has to put up with this like horrible thing. Like that is horrible. Because I mean, even for like you know. Um, like I love horror movies and I love gothic stuff and skulls and metal music and stuff like that but like you know even for me who obviously I'm not quite as you know I'm not as god fearing as my grandmother and all that mm. but like yeah if I found a skull in my wall I'd be like disconcerted I don't think it would be something that you'd be like worried about all the time but there'd be yeah. every now and again you think about just go, Oh my god, you know, there's, like, a, sc- there's you know, a skull there. You know sometimes it's like you're lying in bed and it's not one of those nights where you fall asleep straight away mm-hmm. and then you just toss and turn and then suddenly you just it would just come into your head. Yeah. The skull. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then you'd almost have like a nightmare about it because it was the last thing to think about before you went to sleep. Or uh-huh. you would then not be able to sleep because all you'd be thinking about, you could just see the skull in your head. Yeah. You'd have your eyes shut and all you could see was the skull like when the builders called you and you just have that image of like seeing the skull and the walls just like the teeth open. Oh. You know what I mean? Did you, do you know if she saw the skull? Yeah, well, I'm pretty sure she did because yeah. obviously the builders had to ask her what to do with it because when that builders just find a human, like, remains mm. in, like, your house, that's obviously, like, quite a big deal. I expect yeah, it sketched yeah, out yeah. the builders. I expect they were like, whoa! Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> imagine, like, imagine that, <laughs> yeah. You know? That is terrifying. Crazy. Damn. But, yeah. Hopefully it's a good omen. Hopefully it was left there to, to oversee the house and protect the it house It was the owners. skull of Merlin. Yes. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, who knows, man. But yeah, whatever. Like, let's hope it was the best scenario it could possibly be. Exactly. Anyway. Exactly. But it makes you almost want to. Um, it makes you almost want to like try and delve into archives and see, like, you know, go back through the centuries and see because they've been living in the house since about nineteen ninety like three mm. or something like that. And it makes you want to almost like delve back through the archives and see if like in there was any around that area. Imagine if, if you if just there found was, like, a like, horrifying story. Do you know what I mean like, a, mi- like a missing persons case or something? Or oh like, you know, God. Tabitha Winslow yeah. went missing. And like, just d- despite like frantic searches, you know, before friends and family and the local police, she, her body was never found. And then mm. it turned out that like, I don't know, like a hundred and. Someone that owned the house before was like linked to it. You somehow. found out that like there was some creepy guy that lived there 200 years ago and he like. 
and like he never would come out in the day, but they'd see like one dim lamp on at the night every night, <laughs> and like there were like rumors that he was like an occultist. Yeah, I love that imagery of just having one dim lamp. And they go, that's old man Jenkins, and that if any, yeah, <laughs> yeah that old man Jenkins, and that like over there. whenever he'd get like posts, like. All that would happen is like a creepy door would open, no one would ever see his face, just an arm would reach out and just yeah. like grab it and like slowly <laughs> yeah. withdraw and then he'd like slap and then he'd like slowly put the door back again. Yeah. And like yeah, not exactly. even say a word. Exactly. Everyone's told to stay like, away from that. And it would that be like house. a ridiculously pale hand, like 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 literally like white as 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 the walls. Uh -huh. like, like literally just white. Like milk white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, Ghost like, white. with like creepy fingernails. Oh. Like all like long and dirty. Long dirty fingernails on this like creepy, <laughs> gaunt, white, pale hand. Oh, that's old man Jenkins' house. Stay clear, son. <laughs> Stay clear of that house. <laughs> yeah, like you can imagine, like some little kids are like playing football in the street, and they yeah. accidentally kick like the football yeah, into yeah, the yeah. ground, and they're about to go the get it, there. and they just hear, that. yeah, like the, the postman walks past. Don't, kids. <laughs> Why, sir? It's old man Jenkins' house. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like just leave in their garden. There's just, just leave of, like, it balls be. and stuff. The postman just will go yeah. and collect it. The postman just puts his hand in his pocket, gives the kids a couple of shillings. <laughs> go buy yourself a new ball. Yeah. Best to just leave it, son. <laughs> oh my god. Imagine yeah. if you did like do research on your old house, and then you just found that there was like some horrifying like case from the house. The house I live in's actually got a bit of a bad history. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Can you not, say not, what it is? Um, yeah, I will. I, um, I mean, I, I guess I'm not talking about my address or anything, so I, I don't obviously, I don't want to, I mean... Give out your private yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's obviously, it doesn't bother me, and I'm not going to obviously say what exactly house I live in or anything like mm. that, but um, basically, the people that used to live in the house, because basically, the street I live in, um, my grandmother grew up there. That's one of the reasons I thought it'd be quite nice to move to where I live now. My right. grandmother grew up um, in the street that I now live, but on the other end of the street. But as a result, she knows all the, the goss. And also, obviously, now some of my uh, my older neighbours that have been living in my street for a long time have also told me things subsequently as well. Um, but basically, the people that used to live in the house I live now, and um, when my grandmother would have been growing up in the, like, you know, 30s, 40s, mm -hmm. early 50s, um, it was this really horrible old woman. Right. right? Um, and she was really abusive. No one knows what happened. She had a daughter that lived with her, and no one knows what happened to the girl's father. There was never, ever a man around, but she was this horrible, wicked, abusive old woman, and she used to, like, flat-out horribly abuse her daughter, like, mentally and physically. Like, mental and physical torture. Yeah. And sometimes... Um, you know, um, like she would like force her to like walk to Bridgewater and back to get her like things that she wanted. And apparently, like um, my grandfather told me that when he first started courting my grandmother, because my grandmother's a northerner, he's like a friendly soul. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? As as the northerners often are. Hats, you know, hats off to the northerners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he said that like when he first started courting my grandmother in like the in like the fifties, you know, they'd be like driving sometimes between town and the village. And they would just see her like walking in between town and the village, like the side road, just like bawling her eyes out. And she just what, like, the little girl. Yeah, like the girl. Yeah. yeah. But this is like you know by this point by this point she was like in her like late teens. Right. But she was like you know what they call it like Stockholm syndrome. Like you're so yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you're yeah. so you get in, attached to like your yeah. abuser. So she so she never left. She never met a, a partner. She never moved out. It was almost like her mother wouldn't let her, and mm. she never almost like realized that she could just leave. Mm. Because she was so in that Stockholm syndrome, like became like just like the, the, her life was just being her mother's like yeah. porn. Yeah. Um, but they would see her. Yeah, it was almost like creepy, man. They'd see her just walking at the side of the road, like crying. And she'd oh. always just be seen like walking around doing her mother's bidding, just crying, like just crying nonstop. And people would hear like like horrible things, like horrible like shouting, you know, like her like shouting at her daughter from inside the mm. house if they'd be like walking past the front of the house, and just really not very nice, mate. And um, mm. yeah, and um. I'm pretty sure they both like died in the house, and uh, yeah, when it was like renovated by the people that lived in the house before me, apparently the house was just like in a horrible state, and it was just like almost like a really depressing atmosphere. Right. It hadn't been like it almost the house hadn't almost like been renovated since like the 50s, and like the light switches were like ancient, and all the wallpaper was like ancient, and it just had like this really grim, oh. gloomy vibe. Like almost a look into the past, but in a creepy way. Mm. Like it's just mm. not advanced with the times. And just knowing that the woman was really abusive, and yeah, apparently, yeah, exactly. apparently she's like yeah, like physically would like hit her daughter, and it was just like a really oh, horrible damn. tale. And apparently, like my granddad said, he even like pull over in his car sometimes and offer to give like the girl a lift and stuff, and she'd just be like sobbing. She'd be like, no, I can't. No, I can't. Mother will be angry. Oh. So it's like, oh man, it's just dark, you know. Very dark. Yeah. So yeah, it might not be like satanic or anything like that, but super just still dark like a bad history. In the house. Yeah, it's yeah. bad juju. Yeah. Damn. 
But anyway, folks, with that, we're going <laughs> to leave it there. <laughs> on that nice, on positive, that nice note, positive note. <laughs> have a great week. Um, we've talked about bees and all sorts. This week, bees mm. and... Women. And women. And, um, <laughs> bees and women. And yeah. Java. And fish. And Homo erectus. All right. And really awesome feminist ladies mm-hmm. that run marathons and lift weights and cool stuff. So yeah, have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time for another Pandora's Box. Cheers. We love you.